In 2021, the port of Queemans appeared destined to have a bright future in the supply chain of New York's renewable energy future, as it was announced that, as part of an $86 million contract, the port, located about a dozen miles south of the city of Albany, would soon be building the foundation components of wind turbines that would be utilized off the coast of Long Island. But nearly two years later, and that future is more complicated and may never be truly realized as environmental and management concerns have been raised by local stakeholders and some environmental Mentalists in the region. For more on the debate over the port of Queemans and its future, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Barbara Heinzen, who lives near the port and is a member of the Clean Air Coalition of Greater Ravina Queemans. Thanks for joining us in the studio, Barbara. Thank you for having me. So for listeners who aren't familiar with the port, how would you describe the port of Queemans, which was, I believe, about 120 acres when it first opened in 2006? The port of Queemans opened around there. The land presumably was bought before then, it's about 120 acres, and they bought an abandoned brickyard, P&M Brick. They still use the name P&M Brick for various permit applications, and they ended up getting a license to handle construction and demolition debris. So from the beginning, the Port of Queemans had a clear intention to be a place that handled waste from New York State and various other places. That then began to grow. And in about 2012, the owner, Carver Lairway, bought land on the other side of Route 144 along the Queemans Creek, three to 400 acres. And he persuaded the local town officials to take this agricultural and industrial land and convert it to industrial use. There were no limits on what kind of industry the existing comp plan had wanted to see an expansion of commerce, but not of heavy industry. So this was a major change from what certainly people living along the river had hoped to see in that site. The comp plan of 2006 called for the old brickyard to become a riverfront community. I don't think they thought it would become a dump. Well, fast forward to today, and there's the plans that I mentioned at the top that were announced in 2021, as well as General Electric is also hoping to use the port of Queemans to build components for offshore wind projects. Do you think the port can accommodate all this work in an environmentally safe way and in a way that makes them a good neighbor to residents like yourself? The Clean Air Coalition has two principal objections to the involvement of the port of Queemans in offshore wind. First of all, they've been an extremely bad neighbor. Loud music at night, too many parties? Uh, they don't bother with loud music because they would rather take old scrap metal and just dump it into uh, whatever ship is waiting at the port at any hour of the day or night. Okay. There are no restrictions on when they make these noises. Depending on where the wind is, I can hear it and I'm maybe a mile downstream. Uh, so I can hear their activity at different times depending on the wind direction. Are there supposed to be decibel restrictions well, for their operations? You would have thought so, but for some reason they are never applied by the local town and they don't seem to be applied by anybody else. Gotcha. They've also had no restrictions on the heavy vehicle traffic that comes in and out of the port or from their new industrial park, which they got when they expanded into the other side of Route 144. So you have heavy vehicles going up and down Route 143 and Routes 144, which have been very residential areas for a long time with some very beautiful old houses. And these homes are being regularly rattled, their windows break, their foundations are being affected by the size and weight of these vehicles. And they will be going by one or two of these every 10 minutes sometimes. There can be some very, very heavy traffic. So neighbors are upset with them just on the basis of traffic and noise. Groups like Riverkeeper are also upset with them because they routinely violate environmental standards. I've taken patrols with the Riverkeeper boat with Captain John Lipscomb, and we've been on patrols when there have been barges anchored in the river against very close to the shoreline of Skodak State Park, opposite the Port of Queemans. They had no permits to be there, but by having those barges anchored, and they use heavy pilings to keep the barges in place, they expanded their usable area of the port, which is actually quite small. They're illegal. We report them. They get moved for several months, or they get moved from another place they shouldn't be, and a little bit of time goes by, and then what do you know? They're back again 
expanding their port by putting their barges in places where they're not allowed. They had a fine for importing restricted fill, which means it's slightly contaminated. They were told they could had to stop importing this restricted fill. They kept importing that restricted fill for another month, I think. If they'd been fined the daily fine they should have had, they should have been paying a fine in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. From memory, they paid something like $20,000 of fines. So they're routinely violating environmental standards. They're violating the habits of a good neighbor. And they get a slap on the wrist. They don't get any kind of serious consequences for causing the degradation of local community and environmental life. In addition to what you outlined, my understanding is that if the port is going to move forward with some of the wind turbine related work that it wants to do, it's going to essentially need to transform its site footprint, including making some things that have been temporary in the past essentially permanent. Are there concerns about the impact that could have on the environment? Absolutely. GE is talking about building two manufacturing plants at the Port of Queemans. The industrial park along the Queemans Creek is completely built out. Where are they going to put these manufacturing sites? DEC gave them a permit to add extra docking space, so they're reshaping the P&M brickyard into something that can handle this extra docking space. But that docking space is not for manufacturing. So where will these manufacturing sites go? And there is 200 acres north of the port that are owned by a local landowner. That's Greenfield Sites. And his family also had another 54 acres of land. And that land was sold to Carver Laraway, I think, last year. And in January, the neighbors to that property, which was 54 acres with a beautiful farmhouse, open fields, and a forest of 25 or 30 acres, they woke up one morning in January, February, and the whole forest was being clear-cut with a very minimal permit from the DEC. And when the DEC asked them, why are you clearing this land? They said, mm, haven't decided yet, don't really know. And then when they were questioned about this in a local town meeting, they said, oh, it's, it's going to be a homestead, as if they're out in Montana someplace. I mean, what are you going to do, run two cows on 25 acres? And they said, we have to level the land. What, cows can't walk over unlevel land? Presumably, animals have been doing this for some time. So they're not candid. They're not transparent. It's a private company. There's no obligation to publish public records of their finances or the interests or any of the standards they should be meeting. It's a very, very secretive company. And the only way they can accommodate two manufacturing plants is by expanding into greenfield sites along the Hudson River. Whatever they do will bring in a lot more traffic, a lot more noise, and I don't see how either the community or the river stands to benefit. So then would you like to see the projects that have been either already committed to the port or are likely envisioned for the port to be accomplished elsewhere? The projects that have already gone in, I've had email correspondence with those companies, and the projects that are already committed could have succeeded with the footprint of the port even before they got the permit to have a, an additional docking space. Mm -hmm. So they don't need to expand into the rest of the greenfield areas along the Hudson. They can do those, no problem. What also worries me, though, is that in asking for and, and getting the support for offshore wind, what they're really doing is creating more space to expand their waste management business. In the past two or three years, they've managed to change all the relevant laws in the town of Queemans with the help of a very supportive town board where the town supervisor has, is, is the former legal counsel for the port of Queemans. He became the town supervisor. And one by one, he changed every law that might have limited the use of the port and the expansion of the port for managing waste. Where is this expansion going? Why are we using riverfront property either for manufacturing or for the management of waste that could come from anywhere in New York State or outside of New York State? So that also is another part of our concern about where this expansion is going. We still are asking over and over again, let's have a cumulative impact study. 
what's happened so far since this port began, what are the future plans, and what are the possible consequences. That needs to be looked at very, very seriously. They should not get any money for offshore wind until those questions have been answered. The Department of Environmental Conservation, in response to that idea of the site being primed solely for additional waste management, has argued that that is purely speculative in nature and that there's no concrete plans to do anything like that. So what do you think uh, about that? The speculation is based on a pattern that we've been watching since I first started looking at the work of the Port of Queemans. What makes me think this is more than speculation is the change in the local laws. Why do you need to change the local laws, the clean air law, the solid waste law, the, the zoning laws, if you're not planning to expand waste management? Every one of them is supportive of that ambition. So that's where I say this is more than speculation and it's a risk that we need to look at very, very seriously. I also want to say that, put it on the record, the Clean Air Coalition is absolutely committed to increasing renewable energy. We need to get off fossil fuels as quickly as possible. Anybody who does environmental work knows that the damage of climate change is serious already. We don't need more climate change if we can possibly avoid it. But there are other locations in the Capital District and up and down the Hudson River where this manufacturing can be done on existing industrial sites. We do not need to expand into a stretch of the river that is still relatively untouched by industry and by commerce. So let's use the old industrial sites for expanding industry. We do not need to do it here. And after a quick break, we'll have more about the future of the Port of Queemans with our guest, Barbara Heinzen, a member of the Clean Air Coalition of Greater Ravina, Queemans. Support for the Capital Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. For listeners just joining us, we're continuing our conversation about the future of the Port of Queemans, and our guest is Barbara Heinzen, a member of the Clean Air Coalition of Greater Ravina, Queemans. So, Barbara, before the break, you raised environmental concerns about the Port of Queemans and its future plans. You talked about their past history as a bad local neighbor, and you've offered alternatives where work could be done on renewable energy projects that are now being planned for the Port of Queemans. For listeners who might be hearing all this and think, wow, it really sounds like some classic nimbyism, how would you respond to that idea that your concerns are not necessarily well-founded? Well, the first question is, Rebecca Martin at Riverkeeper would say, what's wrong with being a NIMBY? If you're saying, this is not suitable for my area, where is it suitable for? If it's a bad idea to put it in a greenfield site, let's not do it. Let's put these businesses where they belong. Second of all, very few people realize that the Hudson River is a rare habitat in the globe. It is a freshwater tidal region of the river. Why would you trash a freshwater tidal habitat that is rare globally in order to expand a business for the benefit of a private company? Two parts. Isn't the benefit the fact that we're going to be able to eventually reduce our greenhouse gas emissions as part of that? And second of all, hasn't Carver pledged to fund some habitat restoration when it comes to at least the loss of uh, habitat for sturgeon that might be impacted by this? He's in the expansion. I read the draft environmental impact statement for expanding to include a second docking area. They are destroying five acres of habitat. They are restoring two acres of habitat. That's a net loss. Mm -hmm. It is far better to keep existing habitat going because it takes a long time to recover a habitat. When I moved into my place, it was the year that we had hurricanes, Irene and Lee coming through. The Hanakori Creek, which is where I'm living, I couldn't see any cobblestones. And cobblestones in the creek are where the sturgeon lay their eggs. It has taken the past 10 years for those cobblestones to reappear. So my feeling is keep industry on existing industrial sites. 
They're up and down the Hudson River. This river has been an industrial place for a long time. We don't need to convert untouched land to industry at this point in our history. At this point in the process, what levers do you have at your disposal that you can try to pull to shape the port of Queemans and its developments in a way that you find acceptable? The first one, obviously, is to win a local election and get a more sympathetic town board. That's proving to be quite difficult. Anybody who's worked in local politics knows that you're dealing with a small town. Everybody's cousins of everybody else. And, well, he's my cousin. Of course I'm going to vote for him. So that's a challenge. There's a new team running, and I, I'm really hopeful that they're going to be able to add a little bit of leavening to the pro-business attitudes on the town board. So that's one area of influence. The other area that we've been working on very closely is allying ourselves with the other Hudson River groups and getting them to back us on our fight. Because what happens in Queemans doesn't stay in Queemans. One of the reasons we're called the Clean Air Coalition is that Lafarge wanted to burn a third of Connecticut's municipal waste in their plant as a substitute fuel. They call it creating a circular economy. Friends of mine who, create, who did the original research on what a circular economy is says, no, it's still your same old straight line. Burning is not, doesn't come back. It's gone up in the air. The worst thing, though, about burning trash in a cement plant is that it creates toxic emissions that are not controlled by their existing pollution controls. So what we're seeing is an unholy alliance between a riverfront business like the Port of Queemans that wants to have a, a waste management business and the Lafarge cement plant that wants to use waste as fuel and our fear is that we'll have not only the whatever damage comes from the waste management of the port, then being exaggerated or pushed even further into becoming an air pollution problem because the waste gets burned at a cement plant which cannot handle the kinds of toxins that come from emitting waste, burning waste and the emissions that come from that. So they wanted to burn tires. There's a big argument when we passed the Queemans Clean Air Law to have at least allow the cement plant to burn tires. The documentation on the toxins that come from burning tires, whether they're ground up as tire-derived fuel or whole tires, is, is damning. That should not be allowed. And that air doesn't stay in Queemans. Our prevailing winds tend to be from the northwest. That'll go right down the river. It goes across the river. Many people will be affected by this. So let's, let's just not start. Can we start to think about how we have an industrial base that supports the natural world rather than assuming it can always forgive us? Well, you mentioned getting involved in local elections and rallying other stakeholders up and down the Hudson River. Are you using the court system at all? And if so, how, if at all, are you trying to take advantage of the changes to the state constitution that guarantee New Yorkers a right to clean air, clean water, and a healthful environment? When the town board rezoned the three or 400 acres along the Queemans Creek, several of us got together and we filed an Article 78. Mm -hmm. We won the Article 78 in the first instance. The town board turned around, messed with the language a bit, rezoned within four days of the decision, and then we filed another Article 78, and every objection that was put up to our, our complaint was granted by the judge so that the process of filing this complaint, an Article 78 is meant to be a very quick way to resolve these differences, dragged on for not one, not two, but three years. We never had a hearing on the merits of the case in front of a judge. The judge granted the port and the town every delay it could possibly do, running up our costs to the point where we could no longer afford to this lawsuit. So what court remedies do we have? The other remedy we have is to try and encourage as much public opinion as we can. We, we have a, a petition online to stop the solid waste business or to, to put some reins on the solid waste business at the Port of Queemans. We also have another petition that is saying, please say no to wind power at the Port of Queemans. So please go, anybody who's hearing this and supports us, please go to the cleanairalbanycounty.org website and click on both and sign our petitions. We'd be immensely grateful. Is there any relief that you might find from 
either policymakers or regulators here at the Capitol, or have you given up on that as well? When the town board came into power, the one that's now in, in charge, headed by George McHugh, former counsel of the Port of Queemans, when he came in, he took the good clean air law we'd passed a year or two earlier and immediately rewrote it to take out all the controls that we'd put in there to make sure that whatever happened, you could not burn solid waste in the town of Queemans. He made that much less strict law. At the same time, to back up our position, we had a campaign at the county legislature to pass a county clean air law, and we succeeded. But if you look at the environmental conservation law, there's a little clause in there that says county law cannot override the local law where solid waste and air emissions are concerned. So the revisions that were made under George McHugh have been allowed to stand, which means we have lost our clean air protections. So it becomes very difficult to say, can we please get rid of that little clause so that Albany County's clean air law applies to Queemans? But what's it going to take to take out that little phrase from the Environmental Conservation Law of New York State? How much lobbying? How much time? How much money? We're a group of volunteers. We all have other lives. We all have other work we need to do. I would love to see that law changed. But with all the other things that the legislature is paying attention to, are they really going to give that any attention? That seems very unlikely. Well, we've been speaking with Barbara Heinzen. She is a member of the Clean Air Coalition of Greater Ravina Queemans. You can find out more about the organization at cleanairalbanycounty.org. Barbara, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, David. Support for Capital Press Room provided by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation. Communities across the Empire State have stories to tell. A roadside marker funded by the William G. Pomeroy Foundation can help your town or city educate the public, encourage pride of place, and promote local tourism. More about the Pomeroy Foundation's New York State Historic Marker Grant Program for 501c3 organizations, nonprofit academic institutions, and local state and federal government entities at wgpfoundation.org.